Hi, I'm Rebecca Bryant, Senior Program Officer with OCLC Research, and I'm talking today with Keith Webster, who's Dean of the University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Keith uh, has been a library leader in academic libraries for most of his career, and we're just going to talk a little bit today about research university libraries and how they're changing. So welcome, Keith. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Good to be here. Thanks. So I want to start with a question about, in your opinion, what do you think have been the greatest changes for research libraries in the past decade? It's difficult to know where to begin. I, th I think the biggest thing inevitably is the growth of digital stuff. And part of that has been the growth of digital content of traditional library collections. So our real continuation and acceleration of the shift from printed books and journals to mm -hmm. e-books, electronic journal articles. We've also seen a growth in the retrospective aspect where libraries, publishers, other cultural institutions have digitized older content and made that available. So we've seen an expansion of the digital aspects of the formal scholarly record. Mm -hmm. But then we've seen also the growth of digital aspects of the research record, mm -hmm. not just the end of project report, but the data, the algorithms and code, the community conversations that emerge during the course of a research project. And as that has become more digitally accessible, we've seen opportunities to capture, curate, share, reuse all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So really, this digital um, growth has been quite profound. Secondly, we've seen a fairly stark and rapid decline in traditional library business. When I was an early career librarian, people came to libraries to check out books and ask questions. And that was the heart of the transactional part of libraries, and those have certainly not gone away, but are a much smaller part of our activity than was the case a decade ago. Um, I think the third aspect worth just touching on is the change in how students learn, both how they're taught in classrooms, but more importantly, how they learn outside the classroom. Yeah. And we've seen the library really cement its place as the primary non-classroom academic space on campus. And it's not just that students are coming to write papers and study on their own the way that I remember when I was an undergraduate, but rather that they look to the library to provide not only quiet study space, but interactive, collaborative facilities, maker spaces, studios, digitization labs, where they can really engage in the activities that are being assigned by a new wave of professors who are empowered by the digital revolution that has transformed library business mm -hmm. in ways I've already mentioned. Okay. Following up on the first thing that you mentioned, which is this exponential growth in digital content and focusing primarily on a part of that, that that's the evolving scholarly record, um, how do you believe that libraries, um, how library practices and their missions must evolve to keep pace with this evolving scholarly record? Yeah, in, in, in many ways you could argue that intellectually it's the, the same business, that we are still primarily concerned with being the place that looks after the evolution of science. And traditionally, our role was to acquire the record of that evolution from outside our university and bring it onto campus for our faculty and students to interrogate and build upon, which is a long-winded way of saying we used to buy books and journals and make them available to our community. Outside in. Outside in. Mm -hmm. Today, we still do that, of course more on digital than, than print form, but our focus also shifting to the inside out. Mm -hmm. That as we see the scholarly record go digital, and as we see it evolve, we have a responsibility to help our community make their mark in 
arguably a very noisy information landscape. Our faculty, our students, have the power to be publishers themselves, and they want to have their impact on the world of which they are part. But they can't do it on their own. They are not gathering data and sharing it every day. But if we aggregate those activities across a university campus, there's a great opportunity for us in the library to help them make their mark. So what we see in this concept of the evolving scholarly record is the growth beyond the end of project report into a world where all aspects of the research process are amenable to being captured and shared. Mm -hmm. And arguably every aspect should be, because at this moment in time, it's difficult to predict how in 10 or 20 years' time people will work with these products. Mm -hmm. But there's perhaps a good reason why they might, and it would be a shame not to capture and curate for future use. Already we're seeing that play out with machine learning, and we're at a point where data mandates have been around for a decade or more. So we've seen internationally a growth in the availability of research data. And already, although at times it feels we're very much at the early stages of data sharing, mm -hmm. there is so much available that no researcher, no research team can work with the data that have been gathered and shared. And we are seeing a real interest in how people can build machine learning approaches to harvesting and interrogating the collective data record of research. It's really exciting to see neuroscientists work with each other's MRI data, for example, to build new insights. So I think a, a direct follow-up of that is then wondering, you know, that we, we don't really know what things may look like in 10 to 20 years, but I'm going to ask you to look into a crystal ball five, 10 years or so in the future and speculate on what you think research libraries will look like then. It's, it's always great fun to try and speculate. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to qualify any response to that by saying that every library will make its own decisions. You know, we, we all recognize that we must be part of our parent institution and the decisions we make, the future we anticipate, will be conditioned by the sort of university we're in. If I think about the seven or eight universities that I've worked in, each one will have a different future state and how we get there will vary based on the disciplines prevalent or, or dominant in that university and so on. So that, that qualification dealt with, I'm sure we'll still have books, but probably not as many as we do today. Mm. And what we have today is considerably less than a decade ago, at least on our open shelves. My sense is that new books are more likely to arrive in digital form exclusively. But I think it's fair to say that the book remains a technology that is difficult to beat for many purposes. Mm -hmm. So one thing we collectively need to address is how do we help people get digital content into physical books at the point of need? I think technologically that's not going to be terribly complex. I think that rights, particularly copyright issues, mm -hmm. will require greater attention. So we'll see the library act as some sort of clearance house and broker to help people work with information in the formats that are most suitable for their needs. I think the other thing we're seeing at this moment in time, and it will certainly continue for the next decade, is a demand for training and support in working with machine learning AI type technologies. Now it's not about us becoming computer science experts and building these technologies, mm -hmm. but rather helping those who want to make use of them to have informed conversations with the experts 
So for example, we might have a humanities professor who wants to use machine learning to build a network map. Um, we can help them formulate their questions to present to a computer scientist. And we can also help them with basic statistical computational data science skills so that they can make informed decisions. At Carnegie Mellon, we are seeing a lot of interest also in helping students to become more comfortable in working with data science. We work with a very numerically competent student body, mm -hmm. but they have not been trained, nor should they have been trained, in good data science practices of data discovery and evaluation and assessment, practices of data management and curation, practices of data visualization and so mm -hmm. on. And we are seeing a lot of demand from faculty to help their students become more competent in the areas in which we do possess expertise. And next semester we will be piloting our first for credit semester course in data science for undergraduate. Excellent. So we'll see much more of that over the next decade. And I have no doubt that the work we're already entering in data management will grow considerably. Um, I think the big challenge there is going to become one of data discovery. We've got a distributed network mm -hmm. of repositories, institutional, disciplinary, funder, geographically based. And what we haven't figured out internationally is how we discover each other's data. Right. You know, there are nice national level discovery layers like Research Data Australia. Uh, Google has entered that space with its data set mm -hmm. search engine. Are we happy to let Google manage the discovery layer for the world? Or do we have a different approach? Mm -hmm. What is the role of OCLC in that space? Mm -hmm. Can WorldCat become the discovery layer? It's a, a fascinating question. One of the things I'm, I think I'm also hearing to sort of follow up is that the collection remains important, um, but expertise of the practitioners inside the library is of growing importance. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in many ways, I almost feel we're at a point where this may be irresponsible, but we can take the information base, the collections, expanded and extended almost for granted. There is going to be this cloud of information mm -hmm. that meets most scholars' needs. And the real challenge for them is finding the relevant stuff mm -hmm. and digesting the relevant stuff. And that requires the expertise that librarians have had for generations. And there, there's an absolutely vital role for us to play in that process. But I think perhaps the difference is because of that expanded nature, going beyond the printed record into everything with bits and bytes, mm -hmm we need to augment our methodological expertise with domain expertise. And we are seeing a new generation of information specialists in our libraries who have had fairly advanced exposure in their discipline and who have then entered the library space because they've become particularly interested in working with data and in evangelizing for best mm -hmm. practice. So I, I have been arguing for some time that the library is moving <coughs> from a series of collections to a series of services. And we really are in a, a service model enterprise rather than a, a collection enterprise. One of the things we've been noticing at OCLC Research is increasing library collaboration with other units on campus, particularly for things related to research support, research data management, research information management, or as in more typical in Europe to call them CRIS systems. How is this playing out at Carnegie Mellon and what stories um, do you have to share about how your library is yeah. responding? We have, you know, 
quite deliberately positioned ourselves as stewards of the university's research record. And that has played out on the one hand as stewards of the digital products of research, the, the data management mm -hmm. space. And we took a very intentional decision to migrate our institutional publications repository into a platform that could serve as a comprehensive repository, one that could manage faculty publications, mm -hmm. student dissertations, research data, MRI scans, movies, okay. you name it, we could squeeze it into our repository. And that has allowed us to position ourselves as essential partners for those who have to meet funder requirements or who wish to make their work more visible, more accessible. And we're seeing a lot of excitement from our research community and from our students who all recognize that we are a conduit to making their mark and to having impact in this very noisy information landscape. So that's a, a, a space that I know many libraries are working with. We've been able to, to really accelerate our progress because of that comprehensive approach. In the research information management space, we've been also able to make our mark because we've seen a lot of frustration at different levels of the institution. Faculty, frankly, are fed up having to repurpose yeah. CVs, maintain publication lists, believe that it must be possible to do it automatically, which by and large it is with the right system. Yeah. So we've become best friend to those who need to produce biosketches and mm -hmm. CVs. We've been also able to work with those who want to streamline processes of faculty reporting and promotion and tenure casebook preparation. Okay. And then working through the, the institution administration, those who want to look at the impact of our university's work to understand the citation counts, the alternative metrics, and the media recognition of Carnegie Mellon work. Because all of that helps tell a story about our university's place mm -hmm. in society, which is ultimately what we're about. That has brought with it some interesting byproducts. For some time, we felt a degree of disconnect between librarians and the research community because the encounters we had 20 years ago when faculty came in to ask questions, check out books, browse the latest issues of journals, mm -hmm. have pretty much dried up. It almost became a badge of honour for a researcher to be able to say, I haven't been in the library except perhaps to buy coffee for 10 years, 12 years, whatever. And that made it very difficult for us to do today's job of continuing to build collections and promote services to our community. As they have had to work with us to look at their profiles in our research information management system, we've been able to renew these mm -hmm. contacts to talk with researchers we'd lost touch with. And in turn, we've been able to build exciting new relationships. So what some might see as almost a compliance tool is something that brings with it an unintended good that we're really pleased to see. And finally, we've just launched our public profile service built on top of our research information management system. So again, we're seeing new opportunities to showcase the best of our university's work and continue to raise our profile internationally. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions now about OCLC, OCLC research. Um, how can a library director use OCLC research? And do you have an example of how OCLC research has helped to guide your work as a university librarian? Sure. I, I think the the starting point for me is that OCLC is able to take an international view. Now, I've had the good fortune to work around the world and 
been able to build a sense of the differences, but also the approaches being used in different parts of the world. And OCLC is, I think, uniquely positioned to help library directors in any sector and in any country to see what's happening globally. Because there are so many opportunities to collaborate and build upon each other's work that otherwise we would not be aware of. Um, you offer a great series of webinars and conferences mm -hmm. that I think are an ideal way for people to become familiar with your work. And of course the reports, which in many ways are, are the public product of your research, are things that every director should be familiar with because they contain such a rich picture of what's possible. I, as I, I think everyone knows that I almost fail to give a presentation these days without having the model of the evolving scholarly record in there somewhere. I was talking about artificial intelligence at an event last week and still managed to fit it in. Yeah. Because for me it is such a compelling illustration of the transitional phase that we're in, that we're building a series of services and opportunities around the core outcomes of research. And I find that an incredibly useful model to pull out when I'm talking with researchers, that I could talk at length about repositories and data sharing mandates and all of these things. But if I can show them that single picture, it suddenly changes their understanding of what we're about. And I think it's a model that will stand the test of time. But there are many others, that's just my favorite. Mine too, actually. Um, do you use that model with uh, administrators on campus as well? Yes, yeah. No, I, I, I think administrators generally have worked in the research environment at some point, so they understand intuitively what we're talking about. But it helps us coax them into the 21st century, because frankly, some of them have not done research mm -hmm. since the last century. And it's important to show how the digital change has made possible things that even a decade ago we couldn't conceive of being able to deliver from a library. So if someone wanted to be more involved with OCLC research, um, what would be your advice? Or with OCLC in general? I, th I think connect with OCLC. You know, the, the, the people at OCLC are very easy to work with, always interested in learning what's happening in other libraries. Um, one of the, the great things about OCLC is this global reach, that there's almost certainly an OCLC event near you. There's a regional council that supports your local needs. Um, it is a member-driven organization, and therefore any librarian can find a peer in another university who is engaged, or in another public library who is engaged. And it's a very accessible organization. Um, I, I think perhaps you know, to the public at large, OCLC is WorldCat. If you ask a researcher if they've heard of OCLC, it will be WorldCat. But I think for us in the practitioner world, OCLC's great power is the power to convene. You can bring together people from all sorts of organizations and build a sense of community to share and address the challenges that we've been talking about. Yeah, and I, that's consistent with my experience for the last three years as a program officer working in the OCLC OCLC's membership and research division, where it's very much about convening people, convening people um, successfully, yeah. and also in inviting our partners to participate in prototype development uh, and research projects and so forth. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm interested in uh, international differences because uh, due to um, different sort of mandates coming from national or international um, agencies. Uh, 
I'd also like you to address uh, questions of um, open science and how the library is responding. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot there. There's so, a dissertation in there somewhere. There is a, yeah, it's a big yeah. topic, but it, I ask it because I'm, I'm intrigued by the differences in mandate environments. Yeah. And how um, the U.S. is responding, uh, but in very different ways than we're seeing in the United States, or excuse me, in the U.K. and in Australia. Sure. Um, and and to some extent, you know, there's, yeah. there are <clears> folks <throat> who think, oh, it would be great to have a mandate. And I'm thinking, oh, be careful what you wish for. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. Um, wow. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think one of the things we're seeing, particularly amongst early career researchers, mm -hmm. is a determined commitment to make all of their work open and to conduct research in a very open environment where they will share microscopic observations in real time with their colleagues around the world. And one of the things we've recognized is they are turning to us for advice on the right tools and technologies mm -hmm. to support open science from the point at which they are connecting their instruments to an electronic lab notebook, connecting the mm -hmm. lab notebook to a repository, connecting the repository to a collaborative writing tool, a publishing tool, and all of these things. And this comes back to the, the notion of the library as very much a service organization and our librarians as being disciplinary experts mm -hmm. who can understand what will work in different settings. So we've certainly viewed open science as an umbrella term for a suite of technologies and services that are really being received tremendously warmly by the research community. We're about to host our second Open Science Symposium, which once again will bring an international audience to Carnegie Mellon, meeting in one of our science libraries to understand the trajectory, the use of tools, and to roll up sleeves and get hands dirty you know, building new data sets and mm -hmm. such things. So very much a, a, a key driver and open access and open data are part of that overall approach. And I think the, the question about the different mandate environments around the world mm -hmm. is, is a very interesting one. My sense, perhaps a little bit controversially, is that publishers have been able to exploit the lack of international agreement quite effectively. When we see parts of the world urging gold open access mm -hmm. and other parts of the world urging green open access, it has created an incremental business model for commercial publishers. And I do think we're beginning to see some momentum behind you know, certainly in the relationship with commercial publishers, a transformative approach to journal subscriptions or to scholarly communication. You know, traditionally, we subscribed, we bought access to content. In recent years, we have additionally paid for open access publishing, and that has created a lot of additional revenue for publishers. And now we're trying to shift the conversation and to say, these are essentially the same service and what we want to do is negotiate with publishers for a license that supports that single service of reading and writing scholarly content. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is we're beginning to see now is a more joined up international approach from research funders, from research organisations that might arrive at some consistent approaches. And I've certainly seen a lot of great interaction between our colleagues in Europe and universities in the United States in trying to arrive at a more solidified approach with publishers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Keith, for joining me today. It's been great fun. I've enjoyed the conversation.